Welcome, friends. This is Mike Williams. I recently had the pleasure of joining Brian Stavely on his Dose of Reality show. We had a three-hour discussion where we talked about the McCartney conspiracy, geocentrism or flat earth, and the Mandela effect. Due to the length of the show, I broke the interview down into two parts. Part one is this video where we discuss the Paul is Dead topic, and in part two we talk about flat earth and Mandela. The entire three-hour show can be found on Brian's YouTube channel, and that link is in the description box below. And please subscribe to Brian's channel to support his work. Thanks for listening and enjoy. Welcome back to Dose of Reality. Um, today, my guest is Mike Williams from Sage of Quay. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Brian. Um, those of you, uh, many of you know Mike from, from his, his, own, uh, his own show, his own uh, radio show, his YouTube channel, his blog. Um, I was also on his show, like, um, Mike, when was that when I was on your show? It was a couple of months ago. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was on your show. He interviewed me to talk uh, about the Mandela effect. Um, we had so much to talk about. We didn't really get into other topics. And today, obviously, with my audience, maybe some of you are very familiar with his work. Some of you aren't. We're going to get a lot into what he specializes in. And that is, uh, what, what do you like to call it? You like to call it Paul is dead. How do you like other people to intro this topic? I typically refer to it, Brian, as the McCartney conspiracy. Okay, so yeah, we'll talk. We about can call it Paul is dead, though. But I, yeah, I refer to it as the McCarty conspiracy. Okay, so we're we're gonna get a lot into that. As Mike is an expert on that. Um, when we did that other show, we also didn't have time to get into flat Earth. We didn't have time to get into psyops. We didn't have time to get into a lot of things. So we're gonna touch on a lot of that today. We're also gonna talk about Mandela effect, and we're gonna just kind of tie it all together, kind of just wing it. Um, before I do that. Let me just say what happened earlier, because I know people are wondering, and this is something that's happened to Mike. I mean, not this exact situation, but we're both going through a lot of censorship. And um, as you guys know, it, or maybe you don't, um, I got like, I don't know, maybe 10 community strikes since I've been uploading material and doing videos just since last summer, almost primarily all for my 9-11 content. Some of it was maybe one or two Sandy Hook things here and there, or Boston Marathon but almost all 9-11 content. And I just came off of having two strikes on this channel where I thought I was gonna lose the channel. Well, now in the last two weeks, they hit me four times. So they hit each channel once, which gives you a warning now, thank God. And they gave my Dose of Reality Show channel a full-on community strike. This is all within two weeks. And today when we were live streaming, um, a lot of you guys were watching, they pulled my video for bullying and harassment before it was even done. Uh, I've never seen that. I mean, I, I actually have seen it when I was porn bombed, but as far as for me, just having a, I don't know. And you, you, you know, Mike, what it is, it's the, they'll label it bullying and harassment. And it's really just a, a way to censor you totally eliminate free speech. And they put this excuse out there when they give you bullying, harass, harassment, they don't even give you a timestamp in the video. They just, they just tell you video's gone and there it is. There's no explanation, Brian. Yeah. So I, I get harassed by Facebook and uh, and YouTube, and whenever they are um, censoring me or uh, screwing around with me, there's always this very nebulous notification I get, and uh, there's no specifics. So recently, I, I was explaining before the show, um, Facebook banned my blog. They just banned the URL. And uh, the reason they gave me was that it was... Um, the posts and the blog were reported by other Facebook people uh, to, I guess it bugged them or, you know, it, uh, it hurt their feelings or whatever, you know, so, but they don't tell you what posts, um, they just blocked the blog. They just yeah. banned it. They censored it completely, which meant that uh, it didn't matter what post I had up on the blog, it wasn't going to be posted to Facebook. So what I wound up doing was replicating the blog with a different URL. So it has the same feel, the same look as the old blog. Um, and that's going through. And I just checked before the show, you know this, uh, to see if my old blog was still blocked because I did appeal it. And it looks like they lifted the ban, at least for now. So it's a game that they play with me all the time. About a year ago, a year and a half ago, Facebook went in twice. And, uh, you know, folks go into my Sage Quay Facebook page. That's different from my personal Facebook page. Mm -hmm. And they essentially unliked 30 to 40 percent of the folks that had liked the page to follow it. Yeah. They just yeah. let them go, you know. And they, yeah. they did that to me twice um, within two or three week uh, span of time. Yeah, they play a lot of games like that. And also I noticed 
when um, I went on your show and I told you about my issues with censorship, you also have three YouTube channels, don't you? For the same yeah. type of reasons. Yeah. So they, you've gotten you've gone through the whole restricted video thing, right? Where they just you know they 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 shut down your your view counts. You, people can't comment. It doesn't show up as a suggested video. Um, would you say? Because um, I know we all look at different topics, though. But you've actually told me before. You would say that your uh, Paul McCartney research triggers people more than anything. The McCartney work triggers people. It's um, it's very very polarizing. In fact, it's far more polarizing than what I experienced uh, in the flat Earth work in the flat earth community. And I wasn't, you know, a researcher in flat earth. I was more of a radio host speaking to people that were doing the research, but uh, the vitriol that came through, it's just unbelievable. And by the way, it's on both sides, you know, it's, it's the heliocentric and the geocentric folks, they go back and forth and it gets out of hand. But uh, the McCartney conspiracy and my research and reporting on that really riles a lot of people because, you know, the Beatles and McCartney and Lennon and Harrison and Ringo Starr, they were worshipped. They, they are gods to, to many people. So when you turn around and say it's not as you've been told, that it's a, a monstrosity of a psychological operation, that rattles a lot of cages and ruffles a lot of feathers and people don't want to hear that. Yeah. So what, what, um, what got you to first want to look into what, what made you think that there might be something afoot here with, with Paul McCartney being replaced? I mean, like there would had to be a, t a tipping point for you were like, Whoa, this isn't right. Did you, did he look different? Did he sound different? Did some suspicions around his, uh, what was it? Well, it goes back to when, um, I guess around the 1976 time frame, a little bit before that, when I was in high school, I knew about the clues. And because uh, I was a Beatle freak ever since I can remember, I was just explaining on another show that I actually was bugging my dad to take me to go see Yellow Submarine in 1968. And I was born in 59. So, you know, I was nine years old and I really wanted to go see the Beatles. I remember watching A Hard Day's Night and Help and all that stuff. So I was always a little Beatle freak. And, um, and then in 76, my high school, uh, which was very progressive at the time, they uh, had this program where the students can bring in guest speakers. So uh, a friend of mine, Adam, his older brother, Doug, was um, really into the clues. And so I had him come in and he talked about it. And, you know, I had put posters up around my high school and stuff, and I didn't expect a lot of people to show up. And lo and behold, you know, when the time came, there was standing room only. And it was, it was great. You know, Doug took everybody through the album clues and he played the records backwards and all that stuff. So I knew about the clues, but what happened was I chalked it up at the time and for many, many years as nothing more than a slick marketing ploy yeah, to sell records, you know? Yeah. And it did actually, you know, when the, the clues had come out, especially in 1969, uh, Beatle records spiked. And then in um, the, I guess the early summer of 2016, I came across a book called The Memoirs of Billy Shears. And um, I was on Amazon looking for books and this popped up as something that I might like, something I might enjoy. Because you know how Big Brother operates, right? They, they know what you like and they, they know what you don't like. So the book popped up and I took a look at it. I said, well, I'll buy it. Let me, let me see what it's all about. And I read the book. And um, it, it, um, it was a shocker. And I, I didn't take the book at face value when I first read it, I mean, it was, some, there were some shocking revelations in it. And, uh, but I set out to use the book as a foundation, a springboard, if you will, to either validate or debunk what the book brought to light. And as I pursued the research, I was finding that I wasn't able to debunk the book. Mm -hmm. I may have had questions about certain things, and I had to, you know, dig a little deeper. Um, it did result in me reaching out to the author, who was referred to as the encoder, Tom U. Harriet, um, yeah. to ask Tom some questions for clarification. And as I, I say on all the shows, Tom has been very gracious. Um, uh -huh. He he got back to me, and he would explain when he could explain because Tom, like everybody else involved in this book, and and everybody else in, involved in the McCartney 
um, industry, because it is really, it's big business. Uh, these people are under uh, non-disclosures and um, secrecy agreements, confidentiality agreements. And so that's how it started back in 2016. And um, so I, I happened to mention to a good friend of mine, Sophia Smallstorm, that I was reading this book. And she said, well, Mike, tell me a little bit about it. So I did. And she said, you know, you need to come on my show and, and talk about it. And I didn't want to do it. Uh, for some reason, I, I said, you know, I really don't want to do this. I, I just want to read the book and get through it and get back to whatever it is I was doing at the time. And she kept saying, no, no, you need to come on. So some time went by and uh, we didn't talk about it. And I thought, well, maybe she forgot about it, but she didn't because, you know, Sophia is, doesn't forget things. <laughs> I got, I got, I got Sophia um, knee deep in the Mandela effect right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, she reached out to me to, 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 and she, she was, she was told by somebody who just explained it terribly. And I talked to her for a bunch of hours in the last like, yeah. Week or she had her mom on the phone and everything, asking her JFK, all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Sophia is one of the smartest people I know, and uh, she's she's good people. So she had me on her show uh, in September of 2016, and I, you know, I talked about the book, and this is the newer version here. It's the Memoirs of Billy Shears. This is the blue cover book. The original version, which came out in September of 2009, is the red cover. So this so, is the so when he came out. When he came out with this book, who was he? Who was he known? To, what was he known to to people? How was he known to people as? What was he? Tom, the author? Yeah. 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 Well, Tom had a couple of other books out. Um, and if you go on Amazon, you'll see that he has other books that have nothing to do with the Beatles. Uh, but he was tapped to, mm -hmm. to bring this book together. Maybe we can get into that in a little bit. I'll explain okay. how that works based upon my understanding and some conversations I had with Tom. I, you know, I, I pieced some things together. So anyway, I did this show with Sophia and uh, I didn't think anything of it. You know, it was a two hour show and I figured, OK, well, I did the show. And uh, it was just a an avalanche after that. You know, people were reaching out to me and uh, Mark Devlin. I mean, I knew of Mark, but um, I had never spoken to Mark before. He contacted me after listening to that show. He wanted me to come on his show and talk about it. And so, and that fostered a very good relationship, a good friendship between Mark and I. He's he's a great guy too. He's he's genuine, and uh, he does some fabulous research. So that's that's from basically from 2016 on, Brian. It's almost been almost three years now. It's really been um, uh, the focus of my research. It's it's really kind of topped everything else uh, because there's just so much there, and. Um, yeah, I did explain well, that I am going to sunset my ongoing research. And originally I put a date out there of June of this year, but I'm going to miss that date. It's probably going to be uh, maybe August, probably even September of this year, where I'm going to do a two hour major presentation to wrap it all up. Uh, but the, the information just keeps coming in. And, and there's people there are people reaching out to me that are credible people of course. Yeah. who have well, information. Now. You're, hey, you're the guy. <laughs> like it or not, you're, the, you're that guy now you're the paul is dead guy what's up yeah. paul is dead? <laughs> it's no what's interesting is when i when i announced that i was going to sunset my ongoing research what i meant by that was i wasn't going to dedicate all of my time to this that if if something came up that was significant i would step back in and i would research it and report on yeah. it yeah. what was interesting when i made that announcement uh about two months ago i guess it was two or three months ago all of a sudden, there, there were people that came out of the woodwork. Of course, because they're, they're like, oh, my God, he's going to leave. I mean, we got to talk to him. We got to encourage him to stay on. Yeah. And, and these are people that have information, which I found very interesting. So if I hadn't made that announcement, I'm thinking to myself, would these people have, have stepped forward? Yeah, you might not have forced the information. Up. Yeah, but now yeah, they're stepping forward. You, you got to, some people might not understand, but I mean, that's a long time to be on the one topic and like um people people get aggravated with me like oh brian why don't you and recently i have obviously but brian why don't you talk about 9 11 anymore or why don't you talk about flat earth why i always talk about mandela effect we all go through progression so if things change like if something changes with 9 11 which my theory hasn't changed in years then yeah i'll, I'll have to come right out and talk right. about it I'm, I'm done with it until something changes um uh, with flat earth i mean what's changed in the last year or two i mean i've been looking at it since 2014 and all I see now is just like what you talked about, all the fighting, all the finger pointing, right. all the name calling. I have to separate myself from that totally. I, I, and I still come out here. I've been mirroring videos to do with Flat Earth, the moon landing, all these topics, because I'm trying to show people these topics still. 
but I can't be part of all that, you know, craziness. So I moved on from that. And now I'm talking mostly Mandela effect, but you know, you can't stay on one topic forever. But of course, if somebody sends you information on, on Paul that you didn't have, it, it changes your theory a little bit. Yeah. It'll get you, get that spot going right again. But I remember when you said you were like stepping away, I thought you meant like stepping away more than just that. I'm like, Oh yeah, right guy. You'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, 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 the obvious question here is what's the motive? What is the motive? Well, we know with the Beatles and the Tavistock and all sorts of mind control and, and culture and all this stuff, which we're going to get into a lot of that, you know, the deeper stuff like that. But what is the motive for, for subbing this guy out? Well, the, the motive for the Beatles, we'll start with that first, you know, because what were the Beatles? The Beatles uh, were and still are a massive psychological operation, PSYOP, that was put in place by Tavistock. And the uh, the psychological operation was put in place in order to uh, disrupt the the current course and speed of of the society and the culture, which had these traditional values. It was uh, very Christian based, and so on. And the Beatles uh, introduced through their music uh, and all the other bands too, by the way, because it, remember there was the the British invasion back in the nineteen sixties. They were introducing uh, Luciferianism into into the culture and into the society, and uh, in fact, in memoirs it explains in the Blue Book that the Illuminati declared war on Christianity in 1962, and of course the Beatles really uh, started it in 1962. I mean, 1963. In, on March 22nd is when they released their first LP, Please Please Me, but you know the Beatles were in play back in 1962. So it was, um, it was done to change the culture. It, it was done to, uh, to, to put into place, uh, it can also be referred to as the cult of Dionysus. And I would recommend that listeners and anybody you know, following this to go take a look at the cult of Dionysus and, and, and see if, um, it reflects exactly what's going on in society today with androgyny, transgender, um, uh, b basically uh, revelry, uh, everything goes type of um, mindset and, and, and a lifestyle way of living. And um, so, you know, the, the Beatles brought that into the, um, into the consciousness. That's what they did. You know, as when, when John said uh, that the, the Beatles were bigger than Jesus. I'm paraphrasing there. I, I did a video not so long ago where I explained that that was not a slip of the tongue. That was all staged and scripted. That was all calculated. So at the end of the day, the Beatles are a huge social engineering project, mind control project, an initiative out of Tavistock, created by Tavistock. The Beatles themselves were never organic. They were always on Tavistock's radar. Um, Beatles themselves, the, the, the name the Beatles comes from the Scarab Beetle. And the Scarab Beetle goes back to uh, ancient Egypt and the Egyptian um, mysteries. It refers to enlightenment. So the, the, the pyramid of power, that's who I refer to uh, as the control, as the pyramid of power. Uh, they view Luciferianism, uh, the cult of Dionysus, Satanism as enlightenment, believe it or not. I mean, a lot of people are going to be shocked by that. Uh, yeah. But all you need to do is take a look around and listen to the music and, and follow the entertainment industry in Hollywood. And you can take a look and you can see that this is exactly what's going on and this is what they're doing. So um, so the, the name Beatles, you know, the... Um, the Beatles themselves and John Lennon did interviews. He explained that it was a playoff like Buddy Holly and the Crickets, but that's that's not true. Uh, it's it's all the Beatles are immersed in the occult. They are immersed in the esoteric and mysticism, and it is all based in Crowley's work in Thelema. And um in memoirs, it explains, Billy explains to us that the pyramid of power consists of 66 levels or 66 degrees. Mm -hmm. So the first 33 degrees are the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. And then you have 13 degrees 
of the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. And then above those 13 degrees, there are 20 degrees of people and or beings that nobody will ever know about other than the people that are in those degrees. So that's, by the way, we see the number 66 all the time. That's where the number 66 oh. comes from. It comes from the number of degrees that are within the pyramid of power. So the Beatles are, like I said, uh, so a psyop. Was, was, was the original Paul going to speak out or something? Or what, what happened? There's a lot of uh, theorizing about that. So there's one theory that says that uh, the original Paul, who we refer to as biological Paul McCartney, was not going along with the program and that his mind control was breaking down. I'll get into that too, about the mind control aspects of this. And so uh, he was in discussions with Mark Lane, who was uh, going to do a, a documentary or a movie uh, exposing the JFK assassination, the, the conspiracy there. And um, the way the story goes is that Paul was going to write the, um, the music, the score to Mark Lane's movie. And um, of course, the the powers that be, uh, well, that wasn't something they, they wanted Paul to do, right? Yeah. That's that's one theory. The other theory... Uh, that, seems, that seems almost the too obvious theory, though, doesn't it? Doesn't it seem almost too obvious? Like, there might, there's might got to be something more to it. Yeah, I think that people who uh, who look at that theory, they, they go with that because to them it makes sense. And it, it does make sense to a degree. But with my research, where it's gone is that I believe that biological Paul McCartney, along with John Lennon, were in mind control programs from a very early age, before mm -hmm. the, the Beatles were ever formed, before they were the Quarrymen or the Silver Beatles. Because if you take a look at their childhood, it, it has all of the, the, the indicators of uh, a family involved in, in the mind control programs. John Lennon's father was non-existent. Uh, in Paul McCartney's family, biological Paul McCartney, his mother died when he was young, I think when he was 14 years old. His, if you go look up his father, Jim McCartney, um, take a look on Wikipedia or any other sites that talk about it, his background is extremely lacking. I mean, what did the man really do for a living and so on? So we have this situation where uh, I believe they were being brought along, that they were tapped and identified uh, a long time ago to, to, to be part of this initiative, part of this project called the Beatles that Tavistock was putting together. So they were groomed in essence. Um, and we, there's a lot of indications to this. Uh, you know, Paul McCartney, biological Paul McCartney spent uh, an enormous amount of time with the, uh, with the Ashers. Jane Asher's father was uh, in, into the, um, the business of uh, psychiatry. Uh, he was found dead, by the way, in his basement. And uh, the, the way the story goes, that he was in his basement dead for a week before they discovered him. So I guess the police work there was a little lacking. Um, Jane Ash's mother uh, was uh, um, George Martin, the, the Beatle producer. Uh, she was his music teacher. Um, and it, it just goes on and on. I mean, there's a lot of pieces to this puzzle that once you go and take a look at it, uh, a very disturbing dark picture begins to form, Brian. Um, What's that? Well, the picture is that it's it's steeped in the occult. It's steeped in mind control uh, for the sole purpose of formulating an initiative and a project that was going to change the society and the culture, especially for Western culture, um, basically within 10 years. In 10 years, when you think about what the world was like in 1959, you take a look at the values and cultures then, and you take a look at what it had become by the time the Beatles had broken up. Their last album was released in, uh, you know, Abbey Road in 1969. You take that 10 year period of time, there was an incredible amount of societal and cultural change that took place. And it was just, it's amazing. It's black and white. Like, like sort of breaking up the uh, two parent household type yeah. of thing. Like what we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, breaking up the family, the drug culture, free love. This is, um, you know, Billy Shepard. I'll call him Billy Shears, too. This is the guy that's playing Paul McCartney and has been since uh, late 1966. He that was, was heavily involved. I ask you, is, he, is he the only replacement or has there been several? Th there are other doubles and lookalikes. You know, yeah, that's good. Let's just hold that for a second because we'll get back to that because a lot of people ask me that question. 
But you know, Billy was very involved in the uh, in the planning of the Monterey Pop Festival with John Phillips. The Monterey Pop Festival, of course, we had uh, you know Jimi Hendrix and a you know multitude, the Mamas and the Papas and other bands that played there. That kicked off the psychedelic era. That kicked off the free love drug culture. And uh, you know, Billy was uh, a main player, main cog in putting that together. And uh, the CIA was uh, distributing LSD during the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. And uh, the local law enforcement was told to stand down, not to arrest anybody and just let it go. So, you know, that's what was taking place. Um, and the Beatles were a huge piece of it. You think the LSD push might have also tied in with some stuff they were flashing across the screen and the new TVs that everybody was getting around that time? Are uh, you talking about like the uh, the subliminal messages? Yeah, I'm talking like, do you think, obviously there's many reasons they're, they're drugging these people up. You think that might be part of it too? Like subliminal messages in the, in the TV that these people would pick up on when they're tripping and just more and more deeper mind control? Yeah, I, I think what they were doing with the with the psychedelic era in LSD was uh, they were using the population as guinea pigs, and they wanted to see what the effect was when they went into a mind altered state. What would the behavior be like? Um, you know, what would uh, how would they operate in society? What would functioning be like? Uh, how easily could they be um, led? down a different path and so on. So that's that's what I believe they were doing. And, uh, you know, and the drug culture, of course, took off and the drug culture still exists today. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's always existed. I don't, I don't want to say that, you know, there, everybody was running around as a Puritan before that, but uh, it, it really, the psychedelic era, which the Beatles led with the release of Sgt. Pepper on June 1st of 1967, kicked off uh, the drug culture and, and made it mainstream. They put it on into everybody's living room. You know, they made it so that it was in everybody's awareness. Now, not, not everybody agreed with it, but that really doesn't matter because the young people, they were very aware of it. It was in their consciousness, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. How big is the community of people researching this? Is it huge? Is it small? I mean, what type of, what type of Paul is dead. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think it's relatively small and, um, there are a lot of people that will say that they are researchers or investigators in this. And, uh, but I think the number of people that are really, um, digging in, digging in probably, uh, a small minority of folks, you know, um, I, I, you know, I, I became one of those people. And as I said, reluctantly, you know, I, I wasn't really looking to be the Paul is dead guy. Uh, but the thing is, Brian, uh, what keeps me in it or what kept me in it was that it, it's just an, an extraordinary conspiracy. It's extraordinary because in it, you have the pyramid of power, you know, the deep state. Um, we've got Tavistock, we've got social engineering, we have mind control, we have Crowley, we have magic, we have Luciferianism slash Satanism. All of this stuff is rolled up into the McCartney conspiracy. I mean, it encompasses everything and it's massive. It is truly well, a massive think, conspiracy. Think about, I think most people that are listening to this show, especially, you know, the people are pretty smart in this chat. They would agree that like, you know, all the stuff we see in Hollywood and all that stuff, of course, it's an agenda, it's all rolled out for a reason try and give people an idea of my generation because I'm, I'm younger you know I'm, I'm 41 I wasn't around for the Beatles but the scope of how big they were I mean they they squash right. all the stuff they were so huge Paul McCartney to this day the what do you what do you address him as the guy that's presented as Paul you call him Fall is that what you call him I just call him Billy I mean that's his name his name is William and uh so I refer to him as Billy what is he worth a billion dollars oh uh, it's I don't even know I mean it's his his worth is astronomical. It, it truly is. It's astronomical. And uh, so, I mean, he's uh, made a lot of money with this. And, um, you know, and we can get into that, too, about the money aspect of this. And, you know, what that means is uh, it's actually extracting your material world energy, your physical world energy, right? Whenever you spend money on something and you dedicate your time yeah. and attention to something, right? We can get into that. I do want to answer your question, though, about the death of Paul McCarty and, and why was Paul, you know, taken out um, based upon memoirs. And I believe this to be true. I've, I've uh, 
been working with Richard Balducci. Richard, I did a show with Richard, and he has he's an expert in the occult. Um, Paul was taken out because he was a ritual sacrifice. So back in 1962, uh, according to memoirs, he and John Lennon engaged in a satanic ritual. Now, we will, we will use Luciferianism and Satanism interchangeably here. Now, I realize that if there are Luciferians and Satanists listening to the show, they will debate that those two terms are interchangeable. But but for the sake of this discussion, we'll use them interchangeably. Okay. Um, they engage in a ritual back in 1962. And that essentially what that ritual was about was they would give their lives for the success and the fame and fortune of the Beatles. That mm -hmm. was basically in a nutshell. Any and idea so, what this ritual consisted of or where it was? I mean, you looked into it a little bit, right? Where, where did this take place? Oh, I don't know where it took. I mean, I don't know specifically where it took place. I'm, I'm assuming it took place somewhere, you know, in, in England, in London. Um, it was overseen by handlers and by uh, priests, Luciferian satanic priests, who, uh, and, and then after the ritual was done, it was reported back that the ritual concluded properly. And so um, from that point on, biological Paul McCartney had four years to go. That was his runway from 1962 to 1966. And um, so the ritual took place. And these rituals are done because these rituals give, give power to the intent, to the will of the mm -hmm. people that are imposing their will or their intent. In other words, they, they have certain objectives and goals. And um, the same thing happened with uh, Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. That was, he, they say he drowned in a pool, but that was also a ritual sacrifice. I've made a case that I believe that also John Bonham of Led Zeppelin, Jim Morrison of The Doors, Freddie Mercury, Mercury of Queen, uh, Boz Burrell of um, Bad Company. So the list goes on and on and on. We have all of the, uh, the artists that were in the 27 Club which, uh, you know, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, uh, all of these, these people. So they enter into PACs. And these, and who are these PACs with? So uh, back in December of 2018, I did a presentation called uh, The Beatles, Paul McCarty, and The Grand Illusion. And I had a clip in there from Bob Dylan. So Dylan going back, I guess, around 20 years ago, I want to say, early 2000, he was uh, having an interview or did an interview with Ed Bradley from 60 Minutes. Uh -huh. And uh, in that interview, Dylan talks about making a deal with the chief commander. And uh, Bradley says, the chief commander, who's the chief commander? And again, I'm going to paraphrase here, but Dylan was explaining, he's the main man, this world, the next world, an unseen force, the unseen world. He's mm -hmm. talking about Lucifer. He's talking about Satan. That's who he's talking about. So Dylan spilled the beans on that. And it, also in that interview, he talked about how his lyrics, especially in the early days, basically just came to him as if it was divine intervention. You know, it was basically downloaded to him that he couldn't write those lyrics again today, you know. So in any case, um, this is what goes on. And a lot of people struggle with this because they just can't possibly believe that there are unseen forces and unseen worlds and these pacts and these rituals take place and that they're actually real and that occultism and magic is something that actually goes on. Um, it is scary stuff. It's very dark stuff. But, you know, when you dig into it, and you yeah. do the research on it. This stuff exists. This stuff actually goes yeah. on. Oh, it actually goes on. And, and uh, you know, not to give those evil people any credit, but those people are kind of at sometimes more in tune with reality because they know there is a spiritual side, even though they're using it for dark reasons. Um, that's why a lot of people have to write that off because everything to them is this this whole physical. And we're gonna we'll get right. more into that, I think, when we talk about the Mandela effect and stuff a little later. But I tend I'm starting to think that we're supposed to get out of the physical realm and get to the spiritual side. But I mean that's a little deeper for later on. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. If that's something you'd like to get no, into. No, it's absolutely on. right. And and it's 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 great that you brought that up because if you take a look at what Luciferians, their belief system and how they operate, they believe that the field is divided evenly, that there is the, the material world, the physical world, and then there's the spiritual world. And you must balance both those, those worlds. 
uh, Luciferians will also uh, say that you must stay objective, that as soon as you subscribe to a certain belief system or you join a certain club or whatever, you now have left the arena of being objective. You now become subjective. So if you subscribe to a certain religion or any other type of belief system, your objectivity has now been skewed. Compromised. Yeah. It's compromised. Exactly. So you must stay objective. And what they'll say is this uh, being objective allows them to be able to cut through the, the maze and it allows them to make better decisions and it allows them to be able to manipulate because as soon as you start to formulate a belief system which t uh, eradicates or reduces your level of uh, being objective, you are at a disadvantage. Yeah. When you are it up against somebody who stays objective. And and this is their, I'm, I'm speaking very generally here, folks, okay? So I'm just trying very to give you general. an overview. Very general, that, that goes with any topic. I tell people all the time, like you're talking about be objective. I'm saying the same thing to people about emotional attachment, researching right. topics, emotional attachment. You're not objective, you're going in with a bias and you, you right. can't, you're never gonna be able to, how can you really research the truth of something if you have a bias? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and so Luciferians will say that uh, it's perfectly okay to to uh, take advantage of somebody who is unknowing. So, you know, if, if they are profane, and this is how they refer to unknowing people, uh, they will say they are profane, then it's not their problem that you don't know. Okay, that's that's an issue that you have, that you don't know something. So they will yeah. capitalize well, and they will, uh, they're opportunists. They'll take an, you know, they, they will uh, take advantage of an opportunity because they can. And this is, and this is how they, they get ahead. This is how they move forward on the ladder. While everybody else is subscribing to belief systems and boxing themselves in, Luciferians will say, we are free of that. So you're down here. And I'm mm -hmm. not saying, folks, that, you know, I'm not agreeing with this, all right? I'm just telling you, this is their thought process yeah, based upon my research. While you're, you know, wallowing around in the mud down here, we're climbing the stairs. And this is why, you know, they're in control. Now, just to delineate the difference between Satanism and Luciferianism, as I understand it based upon the research that I've gotten into, is that Luciferians, as I mentioned, will balance the spiritual and the material world. Luciferians will argue that Satanists don't do that. Satanists are, are far too invested in the material world. They don't spend mm -hmm. enough time on the spiritual aspect. So their, their scales are not even. It's tilted. So Luciferians would do more research into the occult than Satanisms would? Than Satanism? No, I think they're both into the occult. It's just what, from like again, based upon my research and what I've read, a Luciferian, some Luciferians, I'm not saying all Luciferians, would make an argument that um, they ensure that the material world and the spiritual world is balanced as far as yeah. where they invest their time. And they will make an argument that Satanists don't do that, that they spend too much time uh, invested in the physical slash material world and not enough time in the spiritual world. And because of that, they're mired down in the material world and aspects of the material world, and that's to their detriment. Now, of course, there are going to be Satanists out there that are going to debate that and say that, you know, that's not true. Oh, Mike, please don't, please don't offend all my Satanists and Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just, you know, you know what it is, Brian? It's just that we have so many degrees of everything. So it's just like we have degrees of Luciferians. We have degrees of Satanism. I mean, there's this, there's this whole bandwidth of beliefs. We have the extremes on both sides, and then we have everything in between. But it's like that with all belief systems all beliefs. And again, folks, I'm not advocating or uh, standing here and, and, and saying that this is what you know we should all do. I'm just saying, based on my research, this is uh, what they believe. Probably, this, this is, this is how they operate. Yeah. 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 And, operate. and what I've explained, um, I was on the show, the show with Patricia, I explained that I am spending a lot more time now understanding this, researching this stuff, reading books on this stuff, especially Alistair Crowley, because the Illuminati, 
which is the 13 degrees sandwiched in between the 33 degrees of the, of the uh, Scottish Rite of Freemasonry and the 20 degrees above, they are acolytes. They, they subscribe to Thelema, to, to Crowley. So there's a lot of people out there that believe that Alistair Crowley is just, uh, you know, he's a carnival barker, that they don't pay any attention to him, that he's just, you know, he's just some cartoon character. Well, you better rethink that position because Crowley is extremely influential within the pyramid of power, extremely so. And, mm -hmm. um, and Thelema is, if you want to call it a religion, a lot of uh, Crowley acolytes, you know, really, really get upset when you call it a religion, but it's a religion and that's what they subscribe to. And it's based upon his, uh, his book, the book of the law. Do you as thou wilt. You were talking about, um, how they, they, they kind of just put it out there. And if you, you just go along with it, it's fine. They'll just manipulate you. Yes. Uh, and we, we know that with a law, at least in my opinion, when there's all these mistakes made, I won't say we know because other people, especially in the flat earth community disagree. But I think when all these mistakes are made, it's obviously pre-recorded, prefabricated video, whether it's 9-11 videos, ISS footage, why would it ever be live? Those mistakes are left there on purpose. They show their hand, they use that yep. to gauge where they're, they're gonna put their next hoax, this and that. And to them, it's like, okay, well, you know, we, we showed our hand. If they're gonna go along with it and don't speak up, we kind of got their consent. Um, what are some of the obvious clues that you think they left intentionally to reveal that this is not the original Paul McCartney? Because they have to be some things that they actually did put out there in your face. Yeah, yeah. So let me just, before I get there, let me just, because you are on a very important uh, okay. point here on free will. So mm -hmm. the the pyramid of power subscribes to free will. And they also call it free agency. And you're absolutely right, Brian. So what they do is they put it out there. Uh, you'll hear Mark Devlin, my good friend Mark Devlin, refer to it as revelation of the method. And they put it out there and they show you the truth. And if you decide to bypass it, ignore it, that's on you. You've consented. Mm -hmm. You've consented by, by inaction, by not doing anything about it. You just accepted it. And if you accept it, what happens is that is now in play. That's how our reality got to where it is. This is why everything is so upside down and screwed up. It's because they present it to us, they show it to us, and people don't see it. They ignore it. And by not seeing it, ignoring it, um, trying to debunk it, what happens is the reality that the controllers are looking to manifest is manifesting. Yeah. And That's, we've accepted it. And we've accepted it. Exactly. Now, the biggest clue that they have with regard to um, the guy today, I'll pick on you know Bill, not being biological Paul McCartney is, is quite honestly, is they don't look alike. Now, people think they look alike, and um, I used to think that until I put a montage, a collage of pictures together, which I, I took a pictures of McCartney over a timeline, and I, I laid them up against each other in a PowerPoint, uh, three PowerPoint slides. And lo and behold, I mean, these guys are completely different. But the way they did it was they placed them in, um, in, in a scene where he was Paul McCartney. So in other words, when they first introduced him on the cover of Sgt. Pepper, they introduced Billy with the other Beatles. So we had John, George, Ringo, and who's the other guy? A, so you had to, at, right from the beginning, you would get a blending of the two realities of the two yes. guys. Kind and, of accept them both, and then they could kind of just branch it off whatever way. Exactly. It's it's a, a perfect way of send, uh, saying it. It's They've blended it. They've conditioned people to accept the blending, the, the you know, the hybrid aspect yeah. of this they, they've actually gone back uh and i i believe they've been doing this boy they must have started i would say probably yeah. in the early to mid 60s you know the advent of the modern day internet was 1990 they were doctoring and fudging pictures going back uh in time and they would they would you know they would uh blend pictures of uh yeah. billy with biological paul they would blend pictures of other doubles of paul mccartney with biological paul they would take pictures of doubles and lookalikes. There were several other doubles and lookalikes that were put into play other than Billy. Billy's the performer. There were others that were actors for public consumption. So they, they, they took all of these pictures and these images and they put them out there. And so what happens is the public becomes snowblind. You know, this all just comes one big mishmash of stuff. Yeah. 
and you and you, you don't delineate. You don't you don't look at it and say, oh, well, that guy is different from that guy. They just tell you that's Paul McCartney. And then you're like, oh, OK, that's Paul McCartney. And that's how it's been chugging along. So the biggest difference is if folks would just take a look at the, the different pictures over time, you will see that these are different people. They are clearly different people. There's a different in height. There's a different in ears. Um, there's a different in uh, shoe size. Uh, you and I talked before the show about six toes versus five toes. Maybe we could talk about that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. The clues are dropped in all of the songs. Uh, Billy's still dropping clues in songs. Um, many of the Beatles songs are, have back masking, songs that people don't even know. Next two things I was going to ask you was uh, hidden messages in songs and yeah. back, ma back, back masking and what your opinions on. So obviously your opinion is those are two very, very real and relevant things. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so in memoirs, uh, Billy tells us that, you know, they back masked, uh, not just him. I mean, the rest of the Beatles, they back masked all the time. And uh, so if you play Let It Be backwards, uh, you're going to hear he died, he died, he died. I mean, it's clear as day. I mean, it's not something you got to sit there and kind of move your head back and forth to see, uh, kind of sounds like it. No, it doesn't kind of sound like it. That's what he's saying, you know, and all of the Beatles songs, uh, starting with Sergeant Pepper, are, contain Paul is dead clues. And um, so the songs are, are layered. So what that means is there's the first layer of the song. So if you're listening to it, it's going to mean something to you. Uh, mm -hmm. As an example, if you listen to the song, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, George is singing about, you know, it sounds like he's talking about the world and how the world needs help, right? That's one interpretation of it. But the songs are layered. And this is a Masonic technique, by the way. Okay, so this is all Freemasonry. And there's a deeper level. So when you listen to the deeper level and you're able to put it into context, once you understand that there was a swap, there was a replacement, and you listen to the songs, you'll put it into a different frame or a different, it'll be it'll have a different reference, frame of reference. And then you'll begin to understand that they're not singing about the world. They're talking about the song, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, is about Paul. It's a, At the end of the song, you're going to hear George sing. It sounds like he's saying, oh, 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 oh. Listen to it closely. He's saying, Paul, Paul. Paul, Paul, but the way it was done in the mix, put some headphones on, it doesn't, you know, at first glance listening to it, it doesn't sound like Paul, but it is. And there were many songs uh, where I didn't realize that they were Paul is Dead songs that the Beatles did that were, um, they're all Paul is Dead songs at the end of the day uh, from 1967 on. Other bands were in on it too. So uh, the Rolling Stones, uh, the Who, won't get fooled again is a Paul is dead song. Isn't it crazy how the mind works? Because they're, they're, even though, like you said, there's layers of it, right? And so you're going to get to a certain point before you recognize the underlying message. But your brain subliminally is going to pick up that underlying message even when you're listening to it on the surface. So you're listening to it on it with the commercial lyrics that everybody thinks it is or whatever. Right. But your, mind, your mind is still being programmed to the underlying the underlying issue. This is a huge psyop. So this is like, you know, this is almost as big, this is bigger than like a, a Sandy Hook or these other things. I mean, this is, this is huge and it spans decades. I mean, look at all the, I mean, I don't have to tell you, but I mean, look at all that, that's gone into this. 60 Pretty years. Cool. So, you know how I asked you, like, you know, what are some of the, the dead giveaways or clues that they might've left? Well, never mind what, maybe they didn't try and leave this clue. Maybe they try and make it match, but like, Mike, you're a guitar player, right? That's what you do. Yeah. And you're a musician, long time, right? Right. So when you listen to his music, it's how close is it to the original music? Or did it's, they always use this guy's music and just switch the character out? And was the original Paul lip syncing in the beginning so this guy could go live later, perform the shows? Like, what's going on? How's this work? Okay, so the way it worked was, let me just take you through. It, it was, uh, the way Tavistock did this was very methodical. So it was very incremental. Now, they couldn't, come out with Sergeant Pepper in 1962 because it would have been rejected, right? Society and the culture was not conditioned for psychedelic music. So the first Beatle album was Please Please Me, and it was just a boy band, straightforward rock and roll. A lot of the songs weren't McCartney and Lennon songs or Lennon McCartney songs. It's a lot of covers. And so the first uh, couple of albums were like that. Um, 
they progressed as time went on with each album. So they were introducing more sophisticated music, more sophisticated messaging as the albums progressed. So by the time we got to Rubber Soul in 1965, we were getting this very Dylan-esque type of sound to the Beatles and the, and the Beatles themselves as songwriters. And we can maybe talk about whether the Beatles actually were doing all the songwriting. That's something that makes a lot of people very agitated who, who listen to my work, but you know, maybe we'll save that yeah. for- Well, know, that, that actually triggers people if you suggest they didn't write their own material. <laughs> You think that'd be something that'd be, you know, pretty. Yeah, I, let, well, I, to a degree. <laughs> I'll take you through the albums real quick, and then we could talk about that. Um, so we had, you know, Rubber Soul really was this really different album. It was very sophisticated. It was a lot more complex. The songwriting was light years ahead of, you know, Please Please Me and uh, with the Beatles and the early, you know, the first two albums. Um, Beatles for Sale, light years ahead of that stuff. And then they moved to Revolver. And of course, you know, Revolver, the last, I think it's the last track, Tomorrow Never Knows, was the, the introduction or the segue of the Beatles going into the psychedelic era. So, but the music from Please Please Me to Revolver was very different than when Billy took over. Uh, the, the music that the Beatles did from 62 to 66 was very oriented toward relationships, boy and girl, girl and boy, I want to hold your hand, I lo she loves you, yeah, 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 all of this stuff. When Billy joined the band, he, he became the leader of the band, um, and this was part of the negotiation when he came in, and he said, no more of those love songs, we're going to take this to a, another level. And that level, to begin with, was uh, the psychedelic era. So the music did change. It, it, it changed very much. In fact, if you listen to Paul McCartney sing Yesterday and uh, the Biological Paul and you hear him sing um, uh, Here, There and, and, and Everywhere and Eleanor Rigby, and then take a listen to the guy who's singing Penny Lane mm -hmm. and listen closely. Is, is that the same guy? No, it's not the same guy. It's, it's not the same guy. But the, the music definitely changed. So it went from boy band, rock and roll in the beginning days, a lot of cover tunes. They evolved with re, uh, Rubber Soul and Revolver. And then boom, all of a sudden, this new band appears, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, where he, Billy actually introduces himself with the song. Um, he introduces himself, Billy Shears, at the end of Sgt. Pepper, leading into the song with a little help from my friends. And so from that point on, uh, you know, the White Album is is you know, very different than any of the songs, uh, the albums that the Beatles did post-1967, um, as was uh, Abbey Road and, and so on. Uh, now, going to, the, going to whether they wrote their music or not, the, the interesting thing here is that the Beatles wrote something like, uh, I, have to, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I think it's something like 250 or 60 songs over the course of, let's just say, six years. Um, that's 40 songs that's a, a year. Song. Yeah, that's 40 songs that actually made it to albums. Now, to write, to write one song, you typically have to run through two or three, maybe four songs, right? You're going to try a couple of things out, a couple of riffs, chords, lyrics, or whatever, and you might say, yeah, that's not working and you move on. And what happens is you eventually hit on a song. So to have recorded 200 and something songs, 240 or 50 songs over that period of time, the Beatles themselves had to have written an enormous amount of songs, you know, much more than 250 songs. Let's just say, give them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, they had two attempts to write one song. That means they would have had to write 500 songs in order to get to 250 in six years. And that's and, and that's a ridiculous number because it's far more than 500. As a songwriter myself, and I'm not equating myself to you know Beatle talent, but I can tell you how the process works. So the question becomes, if they didn't write all those songs themselves, well, who helped them? So I believe that it's very possible that they had uncredited professional songwriters that came in that helped to write songs and it's it's possible that um these uncredited professionals that came in helped 
to shape the songs that McCartney and Lennon came in with. So in other words, when Biological Paul came in with a song or John Lennon came in with a song in 64, 65, 66, right? They would play the song and they had professional songwriters there, ringers that would say, you know what? That's a pretty good song. That's a good start. But you know, we need to change the verse. We need to change the bridge. It needs to have a better hook. Now, one of those people that I believe was heavily involved in this was their producer, George Martin. Mm -hmm. For one, for starters, I believe George Martin was front and center doing that type of work. But I Did also he have a believe style others. That Did he have a, that? A, yes, right? Did he have a previous writing style that you recognized, and that why you think he? Uh, he did that. No, no. But George Martin was, you know, George Martin was heavily involved in theater and show show tunes types of uh, music, I believe. And, uh, you know, he's classically trained. But, uh, you know, he's classically trained through Tavistock. And so uh, I'm not saying that George Martin was the only person. I, I do believe today, Brian, and again, this is a belief that I have. It's it's You can't really prove this because nobody has stepped forward to say, oh, yeah, I was there to help write the songs. Um, but I, I, I do believe based upon the number of songs that were written, based upon the fact that these the age of these guys, some of the songs, the lyrics are way beyond, um, you know, the, the worldliness of their age. So there's a song that, that Paul McCartney wrote, I believe it was on, uh, maybe it was on Rubber Soul, I lose track sometimes, For No One. The, the lyrics to For No One comes from somebody that really has a lot of experience from being in an ex in a relationship with a woman. I mean, it's, it's a very deep song, right? How did that come from a guy who's 23, 24 years old? I mean, how did he come up with those lyrics? So is it possible that he did? Yes, it's possible. Is it probable? Mm, that's where I get stuck on it. You know, I think maybe it's, it's, not, it's not probable. Possible, but not probable. So in any case, um, so I, I, I do believe they got some help and, um, I think maybe the help subsided once Billy got there because Billy is a formally trained musician. He has a lot of musical training. His training started very, very early in his in his childhood. He was um, he was tapped, and he was he was brought along ever since he was a child to wind up in a place where he would have tremendous amount of influence. Now, at the time, they may not have thought it, obviously it was going to be the Beatles. But Billy Shepard or Billy Shears was going to wind up in some very influential position in the music and entertainment industry. That was going to happen. He's blue was blood. He the agent? Was he just a lucky agent or what's his family ties to this? He's well, have some okay, so it's ties. very interesting with the family ties, right? So in memoirs, he, he, alludes, uh, to, he alludes to the possibility that Alistair Crowley was his father, alludes to it. Now, mm -hmm. He, he says that he is a descendant of William Wallace. William Wallace goes back to, uh, uh, he's the famous war hero, uh, um, freedom fighter of uh, the Scots going back. It's the, it's the character that Mel Gibson played in Braveheart. Now, Billy mm -hmm. says in the book that the, the storyline in Braveheart wasn't accurate, but be that as it may. So Billy's, Billy's ancestry goes back to William Wallace who they refer to as, or he refers to as the Hardy Warrior. When you look up the surname Crowley, the surname Crowley means the Hardy Warrior. Now, in the book, in this book here, the blue book, this is the new book, folks. It's the, uh, the 9 after 909 edition. Billy tells us that he was tutored by Crowley up through the age of 10. Now, Billy is five years older than biological Paul. So which means he was born in 1937. Mm -hmm. Crowley died in 1947. Mm -hmm. So there's a 10 year period of time where he was tutored by Alistair Crowley. This is what it says in the book. It also says that Billy was subjected to mind control as early as the age of three. Now he went through mind, he went through the mind control program because it was instilling discipline in him. So the mind control was done in order to ensure that he had the motivation and the drive and the mindset to be successful no matter what, that he would defy any odd, any obstacle, and he would plow ahead and he would be successful. 
This is what's said in the book. This is very, very important information, and it's also very dark. Here's a kid. Uh, his earliest memory of being in a mind control program, three years old, tutored by Crowley to read backwards, do all the backwards stuff. I'm sure he was trained in the book of the law, um, in, in, you know, in Thelema. And, um, you know, and he is a, a, a Crowley acolyte. There's no question about it because on a show that I did uh, maybe about a year ago or so, a year and a half ago with Nick Shylock, Nick had said in the show that uh, Billy had said in, in memoirs that Crowley, his doctrine was a doctrine of hate. That's in the Red Book. Nick misconstrued that and said that, then said in that show that Billy hated Crowley. The Blue Book comes out. On, P on page 326, there's a footnote. That footnote refers to my URL, my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it says in that footnote, Tom writes, William enjoys the content and the material at www.jamespaulmccartney.com. That is my domain. Believe it or not, I have that domain, jamespaulmccartney.com. And in that footnote at the bottom of page 326, Billy through Tom says, but I want to make a correction. I don't hate anybody and I don't hate Alistair Crowley. Um, he feels that Crowley should have showed more love to his family. I'm paraphrasing here, okay? Yeah, yeah, more love to his family, meaning me, your son. His son, or uh, uh, I believe, I, I'm not sold that it's his father, but I believe that Crowley is a relative, is related to him. He's related to Alistair Crowley. Also in the book, he mentions 9-11, being on the tarmac, watching the whole thing going down, and then saying he was very disappointed that his relatives were involved in what happened with 9-11. Who was he referring to? He was yeah. referring to Barbara Bush. That's who he was referring to. It, I, it's Look, it gets very, very weird, okay? But oh, the thing yeah. is, when we look at the bloodlines, Brian, and you know this, because we look at all the presidents, right? A couple yeah. of people did work on this. They're all related. They're all bloodline related. So all of these people who are in influential positions, who are born and bred out of the pyramid of power, the blue bloods, yeah. the elites, they're all related. Yeah, that's why that's why races and borders and all that, that's all just an illusion to keep us divided. And what we really should be looking at is bloodlines with these people. Exactly. Not that I spend, I don't spend so much time focusing on the, the who and the they as much as I do the process and the way yeah. these stop-ups work and stuff, just because you'll end up chasing your tail, you know, all day. Because there's going to always be people you don't know who they are. But, yeah, the bloodlines is what they care about. They don't, they don't, they don't care about uh, your, your, your race or your board. I mean, that's all just, that's all just propped up for that. Mike, you mind if we take a, a five-minute break? So Absolutely, can... Brian. All right. And, guys, we got 107 people live. Everybody, please thumb up. Please share it. And we'll be back in five minutes. You'll listen to Dose of Reality with Mike Williams from Sage Equate Radio Hour and Brian Stavely. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Dose of Reality. I'm your host, Brian Stavely. I'm here today with Mike Williams from Sage Equate Radio Hour. Thank you for sticking with us during that brief break. And, Mike, I, was, I forgot, too. I was going to ask you before the show to send me some of your music. I could play it during the break. But um, <clears throat> how long have you been making your own music anyways? Hey, Brian, I'm getting an echo. You are? Hang on. Okay, think we're good? Now? Yeah, good. good. Yeah, I think it was just when we uh when we reconnected. Okay. Um, oh, what was I gonna say? Yeah, earlier before the show, and we're gonna get into some other topics real soon because I know people want to hear us talk about some other stuff too. Um this kind of segues into that a little bit because I had asked you what's up with this six toe thing. Is this like a Mandela effect thing? Because I've noticed that this, you know, and we've all talked about body changes and hexagon eyes, six sides, this type of thing. Uh, this this six toe thing, you want to explain to people what that is? And this is something you have known about for a long time, right? So this is just something that's always been. And, and what is the six toe thing? Yeah, so I was interviewing uh, Tina Foster. Tina's another researcher and, uh, you know, Tina does some, does fine work in this area as well. And so I had her on my show because Tina has a book out also. Um, and so during our conversation, Tina mentioned to me that, um, you know, fall, she referred to, refers to him as fall, has six toes. So I said, really? So um, I believe it or not, 
was not aware of that. So I took note and um, after the show, I looked into it. And as I started looking into it, I, you know, I started finding these pictures and I was looking at them. And so to make a long story short, I, I put a, uh, a video together. It's called uh, Fall Six Toes McCartney. And um, it, it shows there is a version of Fall, Paul McCartney with six toes. And there are versions of Fall with five toes. And in that video, I showed pictures, very clear pictures of biological Paul's feet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Paul, bio Paul has five toes. And so at the very least, the six toe version tells us that there was a, another actor or character playing the part of Paul McCartney who has six toes. Um, now, Billy has uh, his, his right toe has uh, a disorder where it, it cocks up and it's called Hallis extensus. And we can see this on the cover of Abbey Road as he walks across the uh, walks, walks across Abbey Road, the street there. And so, um, because of that, because he has the the right big toe that cocks up, he's clearly not the guy shown in the studio with six toes either. So the 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 uh, the, the short of it is is that what this whole thing with the feet and the toes shows is that there are multiple iterations of somebody playing the character of Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what it shows. And uh, that was uh, an awakening for a lot of people because a lot of folks were looking for very, you know, more specific types of evidence. So even though it's, it's clear that if you look at the facial features, like I mentioned before, it's very, it's very obvious. It's not the same person, but you know, some folks seek to continue to look past that. So when I presented the video on the feet and the toes, uh, there were people that were on the fence that are no longer on the fence. They said, okay, done. Yeah. Um, right. There's another guy playing the part or there's, there's been other guys playing the part. I want to ask you two big more questions on this and then I want to get into some other topics. Okay. Um, so two things. I see you going, going to see this guy in concert. Yeah. What type of feeling do you get from that? Do you enjoy the music? Like, what is what is your mindset going to see this? Like, what is that like? And then I also want to ask you, how does John Lennon's death tie into all of this? And what are your theories on that? And you can go in whatever order is good for you. Okay, so I'll do the concert first. Yeah, so I saw Billy uh, this past Monday in Raleigh. And um, he played for two and a half hours. And, you know, I went, Brian, really as... Um, it gave me a chance to sit back, knowing what I know, and assess. That's basically what it amounted to. And I can see right through the veil. I mean, I, I can see all the scripted parts that are taking place. I mean, he had screens playing on both sides of the, uh, of the stage, and he's showing images. And in fact, one of the images that he showed was the six-toed version of, of – uh, of McCartney. They showed, it the, they showed it? He showed it. He flashed it up there, you know, and I, and I was with, uh, with my lady, with Barry, and we, I said, look, hon, I said, they've got the picture of uh, Six Toe Fall, you know, and so she's, she's, understands this, and, and she's on board with all of this as well, so, which is good, right? Otherwise, I'd be like a lunatic, but, mm -hmm. um, so going to the show, I, I got to say, Brian, that the air is completely taken out of the tires as far as what the Beatles used to mean to me. I mean, I used to, the Beatles were everything to me. They, I used to worship them, you know? They're the reason why I picked up a guitar. They're the reason why I wrote music. They're the reasons why I record music. And um, so all of the shine, the luster, uh, I was talking to Charlie Freak on his show uh, a, a few days ago, maybe about a week ago, and I said the aura that the Beatles used to have for me is gone. Now, what I can appreciate is the craftsmanship of the music, regardless of who wrote it. Right? We can argue to the cows come home. The, the Beatles actually wrote it. The Beatles wrote it in conjunction with other you know, uncredited professionals and so on. Just set that aside. The music itself, I have an extreme appreciation for 
the construction of the music, the production of the music, and so on. Um, you know, harmonies, the, the verses, the bridges, how it was all put together, how it was layered, the songs were layered musically, track by track. Um, still, it's brilliant stuff. But as far as uh, me looking at Billy, I mean, I know who he is, you know, and uh, it's a little disheartening because when you go there, the arena I went to uh, has uh, holds 20,000 people and it was packed. I mean, it was standing mm -hmm. room only there. And so, you know, there's me and Barry and, you know, maybe there's a handful of other people who really know what this is all about. Everybody else is cheering them on and screaming and yelling. And I mean, they're in the moment. I, I, you know, I referred to on a Facebook today as the, uh, the, the church of Billy, you know, the cult of Paulism, if you will. And, uh, and, and this is the whole aspect of where your, your energy is being extracted from you, yeah. right? You're dedicating your focus, your thoughts, your time toward this psychological operation. And then they're going to, you know, they, they've extracted your money, number one, by, you know, the ticket to get there. $30 to park. Uh, merchandise was very expensive, $45 for a t-shirt. Uh, the food's very expensive. You know, if you're going to, you know this, if you go to a concert and you try to buy a beer or a hot dog or whatever, I mean, it's it's an arm and a leg. So the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, the, the whole process is there to, to extract your your energy, your, your physical energy, your attention, your thoughts. Your, mm -hmm. You have to extract, um, extend energy to be able to make money because you have to go to work, right? So yeah. you, you exert energy, you go make, you, to go do what you do for work, to make a living. And then you take that hard earned money and you hand it over to buy CDs and, and albums yeah. and merchandise and stuff like that. They're extracting it from us. Because as fake as we all know the money is in the money system, it becomes our reality because of the, the construct that we're in and it's used to manipulate us. I mean, people yeah. strive to earn that dollar. I mean, it's, it's, you know, as fake as it is and they can just print it and all that. We know that, but it's, it's, it's a huge part of what runs this artificial yeah. construct. You know what yes. I mean? Keeping us into that whole nine to five in these psyops like this, like nine 11, like these fake shootings, all, all these psyops, NASA, all this stuff is, is psychological warfare and they're attacking our emotions and they do feed off, our energy, they, they feed off our bad energy, our fear. I mean, it ties into so many things. It really does. Right. That's exactly right. So um, the way you have to look at this is that all of entertainment, the music industry, the entertainment industry is completely controlled, cradle to grave. Okay. From beginning to end. And it has been, it's controlled folks. There's nothing organic about it. Even if you have indie artists that start off, you know, they might start off as independent, but as soon as the, uh, the industry gets their hooks in them, they start to dictate how it's going to work, okay? So, I mean, it's just the way it is. And some folks, they like to argue with me about that. Oh, you know, this band is does their own thing. No band who makes money has any level of fame and fortune to a level which would be considered to be significant is doing anything on their own. It's They're being dictated to. Extension of the media, and the media is completely controlled, and that goes to commercialized music as well, of course. Exactly. People can't see that. They, they, they know that, man, the music and stuff they put out, especially to the young kids, the teenagers and stuff, when it really hits them and it's really influential, that's just as influential as the 6 o'clock news is to the adults. Yeah. So, of course, it's controlled. Yeah, that's right. People, people idolize and worship these people, and however they act, these kids are going to – I mean, and we've all done it. Going through high school, everybody acts like their favorite musicians or whatever, whether you're a heavy metal guy or you're, you're into rap. I mean, people dress by what they listen to for music. They're that influenced by it. People get clicky in high schools because they're so influenced by the music. You know, the hippies are going to hang out together. Right. The heavy metal guys are going to hang out together. The grunge people are going to hang out together. It's very influential. Of course they control it from the top. Yeah, and, and just I want to add that um, I did do a um, – uh, commentary on the concert. It was a review and Billy's voice is completely shot. Um, during the show, uh, there's a song that he wrote on his tug of war album called here today. And, uh, Billy's voice completely gave out, he opened his mouth. Nothing came out. Uh, wow. he's very croaky. He can't hit the high notes anymore. I, I don't know why he didn't lower the keys to the song so that he could put it in a range that he can sing better. But his voice is gone, and um, 
you know, so this is his last tour. I don't, I don't see how he can possibly uh, go on tour again after this. And I don't, I'm not sure he has much runway left anyway, but uh, I just wanted to add that. Now, as far as Lennon goes, you know, I mentioned earlier that he and uh, biological Paul McCartney participated in a satanic ritual back in 1962, where they said that they would give their lives for the success of the Beatles, the fame and fortune and all that. So, uh, you know, uh, I believe that uh, John's number was up on December 8th of 1980. And uh, from a numerology perspective, when we break John's date of death down, December 8th, 1980, it's 9-11 uh, it's in reverse. Mm -hmm. So you've got the month 12, one plus two is three, the day eight, three plus eight is 11. Then you have 1980, one plus nine is 10, plus eight is 18. 18 is one plus eight, it's nine. So you have 11, nine. So it's nine, 11 in reverse. So, um, and in my show I did with Richard Balducci, Richard, again, is an expert in the occult. He explained that the reason why nine, 11 is a very popular date with the elites, with the controllers, uh, with the, uh, the occultists is because it is a representation numerically of Baphomet. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, so when we write 911 out in Roman new, new, uh, numerals, we have one X X one, the, the two ones represent the two pillars of Freemasonry and the two X's when we bring them together are the sigil for Baphomet. Okay. So I just want to mention that. So if, if folks want to learn more about that, just go to my, um, uh, my either Sage Equate channel or my Paul is dead channel and, uh, watch the show with Richard. It's a fascinating show. He's really, Quite brilliant with that uh, with that information, and that's that's Lennon. I mean, so I think Lennon was uh, that was uh, his time was up when he was forty years old on uh, December eighth, nineteen eighty, based upon that ritual that was done back in nineteen sixty two. So his runway was up. 